What's up? Welcome back to the YKTR Sports Show Zoom edition. Hopefully this is going to be the last one for a little while, um, which I'm sure we'll get into later in the week. But first of all, boys, how are we going, Isaac? Slow weekend? Yeah, good, bro. Yeah, yeah, quiet (laughs) as per usual. Still in lockdown, so hopefully out tomorrow. So we'll be back in the studio pretty soon. Scope, same thing. Skip out a good little week on the punt, boys. He's always (laughs) grateful. He's he's always grateful on Mondays, but he's even more grateful after uh, our boy Tommy Berry saluted on Moanga. In the week mm. stakes, boys. So very, uh, I, very happy with that. I messaged Richie straight after it. I was like, "Did you get on it?" And he sort of showed me how much he'd put on and stuff. I was low-key hoping he'd whacked a bit more on, eh? To be honest, <laughs> that Adidas money sitting there too. Have a go, Richie. Oh, surely. Um, sweet boys. Well, listen, we're not going to muck around. We got a lot to get through today, so we're going to rip straight into the footy. Obviously, the big game of the weekend ice was the Panthers Rabbitohs game. I know we all sort of were in the chat watching along with that one. First of all, your kind of reaction to that game, and then secondly. Nath coming back in and clearly what that did for the Panthers. Yeah, Nath is obviously one of the best players in the game right now, along with Tommy Turbo. But it was it was so they, so much a better side when he's in there. Um, I think I thought his kicking game was elite, a lot like the game before where the, um, Daily Cherry Evans almost kicked their teams to victory, and he was the same. Obviously, he knew Josh Mansour's pedigree and. And obviously he'd been able to kick to him after training for about four or five years. Um, he knew exactly what was going on. And so he had the confidence at the start. Um, he was catching a few. He was getting into Brent Naden and stuff and very lippy too. So uh, once Nath got a hold of the ball and I had a bit more position, he was just landing on top of his head. And Nath hits him probably sweeter than anyone else. Probably um, Adam Reynolds, that 40-20 was probably the best 40-20 I've ever seen. <laughs> that was fucking, that was elite. But and saying that, I reckon Souths get more confidence. I never thought they were going to win this game. Once I knew TPJ and that were coming back and they had a game underneath us about, I was sort of tipped last week that they'll get up, but I still think they can get them in the in the major, or in the first round of the finals. Cody Walker was nowhere near his best. He couldn't quite get into the game and you can see the frustration coming through. And I think Latrell was there as well. Even though they set up the first try and Latrell scored the second one, they didn't get their fair share of the ball in the second half. Penalty count went against them. So, man, I'll be getting confidence off the, off the back of that loss. And a lot like Manly when they played Melbourne a couple of weeks ago and they come back out yeah, and fired. I, I, think it's a, I think it's the same scenario. Yeah, I agree with obviously, um, yeah, that point in particular with Ice. Like, I didn't go away from the, the Manly-Melbourne game thinking, oh, they're, they're miles away here. Like, there's, they'll go and they'll do the they'll do the film and they'll do the video. To Panthers' credit, I had Rabbitohs winning this game, obviously, and it was looking good at obviously uh, you know in the first twenty minutes. But um, there's so much to take away from in terms of like we always talk about superstar players and the effect that they have on games. Nice, it's clear to see how much of an effect Nate has on the Penrith Panthers. Like all the everyone just when he's back. Like everyone just plays their role so well, and they and they play so much better. But with regards to South, like they started the game so well, and then Penrith through nice kicking game just strangled them. And people were talking about, um, you know, some of the bigger names like Latrell and Cody going missing. They just didn't have many opportunities. And the one opportunity that they had to get back into the game, it was that contentious, fucking down the field rule, which was. I, th- I guess to the letter of the law, it's correct, but it's such I've a never bad heard rule. That, I've never heard it. I counted. Yeah, I so they. Used, I, I believe it comes back in in the days around. Remember when Jamie Sell used to stand fifteen meters behind at the, in the Dragons days, Wayne's team, and the forwards used to just go down because so there was no kick pressure on Sell. Sell could kick it fucking bomb at sixty or seventy on the fly, and I think that's when it was introduced. I'm not hundred percent, but. So it stopped that. It stopped from the players going down the field and then obviously just giving up the 10 metres because they'll just happily give up the 10 metres, make the tackle, and then defensively just be really, really stout. Scope, did, you that, that, Scope, did you play in that game in Canberra when um, Jesse Sinner Flair got through and Snakey was offside like he was in front of the play of the ball and then he ends up pushing up and scores like the game-winning try? Did you play in that game? Yes, I did. Yeah, I did. remember yeah, that? No, I did play in that game. Yeah, I did. Um, that, that was in 15. Um, and, but yeah, that's the same sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it was, it's an ugly, like considering like Nichols obviously gave him 10, wasn't a part of the tackle and then just goes and jumps on the ball. I think if they get the ball in that position, I'm not saying they win because Penrith did such a good job of it, but it does make it interesting going in the last little bit. And then, then we would have been able to see the real trail Cody in some good ball because like, yeah, we, we said it a couple of times, just Nath kicked him to death in that last 
30 minutes. It was a masterclass from him. Mm. Yeah, I counted, Scope, I was just saying, I counted after that one, I kind of tried to make an active decision to try and see how many times that sort of downtown player got involved with the play. I counted five or six in the next, like, three games. It seems like it happens basically yeah. every other fucking kick, but for whatever reason, that's the whole thing with the NRL refereeing. If we have consistency, we can live and die by calls like that. I just think that was a bit weird. Yeah. But also, I wanted to touch on, before we move off this game, you and I spoke about it earlier in the year, and you actually called for it early on when they were kind of undefeated and rolling. But the whole Dylan Edwards, Stephen Crichton thing, obviously Edwards is a gun player. He went off, Crichton moved to fullback and looked like it fucking triggered something in him and unlocked all that potential. Is that the move? I know earlier in the year, that's what you said you wanted to do when Momorowski and the boys were fit. And obviously Burton's a gun center now. But would you, if everyone's fit and healthy, are you going Dylan Edwards at the back or are you picking Stephen Crichton back there? Um, I, I'd go <laughs> Crichton. I'd go Crichton. I, I think Ivan will go... Dylan Edwards, I think he's like very safe. The game before um, last week, he got man of the match and yep. um, does all those things. And like, but Crichton can just do things he can't do. So I'll definitely keep him on the team. But I'd be dragging a fourteen, maybe a Momoroski or whoever it is that can cover center, because just in case you're down by points, you could you could get Edwards off and get Crichton back there. Or I don't think he's the winger, like because his carries aren't as strong as Dylan, because you can kind of get underneath him. Um, but I'll definitely carry a 14 that can cover so many positions like a Tyro May that if you're down by 10 in the major semi-final um, you throw Crichton back there get May on to center move everyone sort of out so I, I wouldn't make the switch just yet but then I'd also give Crichton like a bit of a roaming role but like when Joseph Manu plays uh, winger he's allowed to sort of pop up wherever he wants or center I know it's, that's not really their shape because because they like to um, keep their width on the field and and Nathan Cleary controls the middle and you get your ball that way. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be making a change straight away. Uh, that was just a head knock and they probably could have gone on and, and won the game anyway, but I'd have that option up my sleeve for sure that you're 14, one of the most important players in the game right now, can cover the outside <clears> back, <throat> so Crichton can, can, can go back there. Scott? Yeah, uh, probably at the start of the year, I would have liked Crichton. Like, I would have liked to have seen him make the switch on Crichton earlier, like because I believe he, he's got a bigger future at, at, uh, at fullback than he does at centres. Like, he can just do so much more. But at this point of the, the season now, I wouldn't be going making any drastic changes. So I'd stay with Edwards. And I know how, how much, like, the players th think of him. I, I think, you know, it might have been off camera when I was speaking to Nathan. We did our podcast. And they just love him there. They love Dylan Edwards. He just turns up and... Um, he's always in the right spots and he's clean. He, he makes very little errors. I think at one point, I remember I was, I was, I seen this stat where his, by the, his kick return meters, by the time he, he gets into first contact was, was the best in the league. So he just, mm. you always talk about Panthers playing off the front foot when you've got Nathan's kicking game and he puts them into the corners and he strangles them in that way. And then they're kicking out. And then Dylan Edwards is bringing the ball back as quickly as possible half the time they're starting their sets on the 50, you know what I mean? So um, I think that's why they love him so much. And then you've got the flexibility of Crichton who can play fullback, center, winger, like, like I said, if you've got a utility sort of role on the bench, um, there's so much more to cover. So I'm happy with Dylan Edwards there. You find a spot for, for Crichton back in the centers. Matt Burton has to stay in now. Like he has, he has to be that left center. Toto comes back. And then it's up to Momorowski, uh, Brett Naden, Charlie Staines. It's up to them to fight for that fucking wing spot for me. Yeah, and the thing with Dylan um, Dylan Edwards is, like, he, even though he doesn't have much points in and around him, like, I know he can push up and score a try, but um, Nathan Cleary and Jerome and Uppy, co like, cover that basis. So if you look at yeah. your spine as all together, like, Nave's got plenty of points in him. Jerome can set up a few tries and score a couple. Uppy can set it up through the middle. So he balances them out pretty nicely, where if you're in a team more like a, a Titans, where um, their halves aren't necessarily laying on tries left, right, and center, man, that 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 ability of not being able to pass or, or set up tries becomes a bit more obvious, but you, it kind of gets um, band-aided over with, with the boys, um, with Nathan, Jerome and that. So he sort of balances them out pretty nicely. Yeah. yeah. I think Coruscant killed us one to 12 betters with scoring on the hood of their scope, but... Oh. Hey, scope, scope, quick question. Um, do you reckon South's forwards are good enough to... Like, I feel like they're just a little bit light. I know they've got some big boys in there. I feel like their back row is all the same size. You know, we talk about variety in back rowers. 
Yeah. And they, they all feel like they're the same size, bro. So you look at someone like Penrith, who they went up against, you've got Kikau there, um, Kurt Capewell's, uh, like, red tackle like he's awkward to tackle then you've got um, Isaiah Yell they're all like kind of different body shapes even though they're all quite tall you look at Souths they're also short nuggety sort of strong as fuck I know that I know that's important but I don't know I like variety in the back row as well and you got your George Burgess there and obviously he's got an error in him every now and then as well so Tommy are they able to match up against the big dogs it's it's a it's a great question it's the one bit that I sort of worry about in terms of like Obviously, I'll take them over most teams in the comp, but when you look at Melbourne and Penrith, it's less to do with like me not rating South's pack and Manly's pack because I love them both. I just think just Penrith and Storm are elite. Like, and and we and, and as you mentioned off the top as well, Fisher Harris didn't even play, and mm. Brian Toto is another forward as well when he plays. <laughs> so it is scary to think that they can get better. Like, I, I'd like to reiterate again that I'm, I'm not worried about South because I think, like, a few calls go their way and they're in that game. But, um, yeah, it's if, – if you were to – if you were to pick probably forward packs in the comp, they're all in the – the top four teams generally have them. Mm. But at the moment, I'm probably going Melbourne, Penrith, and then the rest. a coin flip for, for Manly and, and Rabbitohs. Manly and Rabbitohs probably on that – a lot of things have got to go right for them. And they do have a, like a few of those boys, that, similar packs in the sense it's like you can't really have too much go wrong for them because like a lot of them don't have that big game experience. They haven't been through the trenches like Penrith and Melbourne have been over the last, well, Melbourne obviously, but Penrith over the last couple of years have played in some big games and, and pulled themselves out of it and, and won some really close games. Whereas we, we're, yet to, we're yet to see that from South and, and Manly. They've been really good front runners. They've, they've beaten up on a lot of, the smaller teams, but they haven't really won those really close games yet. And but like I said, there is still plenty of time. So hopefully we see that first week of finals. Is someone vacuuming? Was that no. my? <laughs> Can you hear anything? Oh, it's mine, Jackson. It's mine. No, I think oh. it might be my eyes might be getting a bit of feedback. He does have those headphones turned up very tight. Um, but no, yes. Yeah, sorry. Can you turn the TV off? In those? Yeah, I just get maybe it's the TV in the background. I get a. Um, yes, wait, all right. Same, we'll but hold up, boys. The one day he decides to clean. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I was just sitting there. I was like, fuck, is that a vacuum going? <laughs> All right, right, so, uh, well, let's let's pivot off that game. Obviously, Scope, I just wanted to amend my previous statement earlier this year when I said the Panthers would go undefeated all year. I meant Nathan Cleary would go undefeated all year, bro. So I'm yeah. um, still undefeated well in the formats, Nathan Cleary. There you go. That's what I meant. Thanks, bro. Um, <laughs> right, let's, jump across, let's jump across. Friend of YKTR, the GOAT, Alex Glenn, um, obviously announced earlier in the week, Ice, that he's going to be hanging him up. Probably something that um, I suppose didn't come as a shock to you, but um, just your thoughts on, on Lexi. I know you've probably got a million stories on and off the field about him, but... Thoughts on the retirement, man? Uh, sort of just congratulations on a great career. Um, like 260-odd games is pretty crazy. Um, I remember him pretty well because we're the same age and we played Brisbane in the semifinals for the Warriors when we were 20s. And like he was always like, after the game, he was always come up and say hello. And obviously he was from Auckland, cousins of Kevin Locke as well. So he come from Northcote. Um, he's just always been, like he's always been the same dude. Like respectful mm. Um, great family guy as well. Three kids. Like he loves being a dad. He loves everything about it. He loves playing football. And even when the Bronx were going bad, man, he, he'd never say anything bad about anyone. So a uh, shout out to Lexi who had a wonderful career. Hopefully the club looks after him for this next couple um, years. I think they would, but he, he's, he's a multi-talented dude. He's one of those, like when we started vlogging, he was one of the guys that started vlogging around the same time, him and Jordy Kahu. So then boys got their wits about them. Um, they've always sort of seen themselves as sort of more than an athlete. I know we've been talking about that a little bit lately and it's becoming a bit more obvious when guys like Connor Watson and Cannon are starting to do it. But he was one of the first guys that was vlogging and stuff as well. So um, he's got his wits about him. I was talking to him over the New Year's. So we spent a bit of time together about what he wants to do. And I think he's big into like helping communities and like that's his sort of vibe. So Lexi's going to be sweet after football. Um, had a wonderful career. Seen seen both sides of football as well. Like he was in those stacked Bronx sides when they had Falau yeah. and 
bro, they, they were fucking stack stacked. And now he's come to the other side where they've almost become a development rebuild style of club. So um, you've seen both sides. I think you get lessons from both of that, but congratulations on a wonderful career. Yeah, Le- Lexi, for me, I'm just going to talk about it in a plain sense, like obviously because we're both back rowers. So I always had a lot of respect for, for Lexi. And um, for me, he was one of the harder back rowers to play against in terms of like my own ability because me being a taller guy, um, those guys that are a little bit shorter to the ground, little nuggety guys, got really good late footwork. And it, and when I used to carry the ball, he'd get really like right underneath me. So in terms of like trying to explain that, like I'm not saying that, um, you know, he's, he's putting him in front of uh, Sonny and, and, and Sam Burgess and those sorts of players that are coming in. But when you had them running at you, you sort of just knew like Sonny's obviously got a bit of footwork, but you know, like with the size of him, so I was able to just shape up on him a little bit better. With Lexi, like being so like his center of gravity was so low, I always found it fucking so difficult to play against him, man. He was um and he yeah, and he and he ripped me a couple of times and obviously had a lot of good years in, in my time. So while I was still in the NRL, he was going through a nice patch there for the Broncos. They had some really good teams and most of the most of the time was on the other end of uh, the score line with him. And he I think the one part that stands out the most is is a bit like I mentioned. He's been the same guy through the bad times. He's he's been a leader. If anything, he's you know he's, when all those guys went out, it, that's when the opportunity to sort of point fingers and and maybe you know kick stones and all those sorts of things. He's done the opposite. Like he's always really motivated. Speaks well. Um, I sent his speech and I sent it into the group chat from the Broncos. That was unreal. The raw emotion and the, you know what, what it meant to him to play for the club and um, yeah, just mad, mad, massive shout out to Lexi and I hope the Broncos you know finish off the last couple of games well for him. And you know, do you know what all those Bronx boys that stayed loyal during that time, bro? They pay them unders like they they sort mm. of used to bank on like oh Broncos with the club and you're going to be playing in finals and stuff. So a lot of those guys that stayed there the whole time and he's probably the one that's lasted like the longest. Man, if they left, they would have got paid way more. Your Matt Gillett's. Um, even if McCulloch and that left like a little bit earlier, like, you know what I mean? Like Benny Hunt and Normie were probably the ones that had their bit more wits about them and got offers, a lot bigger offers than what they were normally used to as well. So I know, I know this for a fact that they've lost money just to stay loyal to the club. So that's something really commendable about those types of guys. Yeah. yeah. Shout out, Lexi. Couldn't agree more. Um, from an older statesman to one of the young guns, I obviously we all saw Ronaldo Mortalo after the Sharks game. Um Jaw looking like, remember when Connie Harrell fucking copped uh, Anthony Tupo with the knee and just shattered it on both sides? Do you remember that? Connie used to mm, run him with the yeah. big thighs up. I obviously saw, we all saw Ronaldo after the game, but he's since posted the scans up. Um, yeah, season gone, obviously shattered for him. But to see that sort of raw emotion after the game, what were your thoughts on, on Moatalo Ice? Um, just shows he's a good bloke. He sort of gets it. Is, is he the one that passed it on to Luke Metcalf as well to score yeah. his first try? So, mm-hmm. man, in terms of like humanitarian in the 80 minute performance, he's probably going to go down as probably the goat. Um, <laughs> broke his jaw and he was giving away boots. And his reaction off the back of it was like, my job now is just to be a good teammate. So, shows the type of person he is. Obviously, that reflects on um, parenting and sort of stuff like that as well. So, a uh, really great role model, a lot like Lexi. Man, to, if I broke my jaw, fuck, I'd, I'd be in the sheds fucking feeling sorry for myself <laughs> on the phone to mom. Like, what was this happening to me? <laughs> and to see, see him sort of pop out and sit on the bench and watch the rest of the game and um, just shows what sort of type of guy he is. And we need to shine light on that, those types of things, as, us as a brand and sort of everyone as rugby league community. So um, we've got a bit of a gym there and um, let's just keep shining light and speedy recovery, bro. Fuck, that'll be sore. Yeah, for sure, and, and and not even throwing it yesterday. The way he handled the whole Queensland saga, he just mm-hmm. must he just must be a really good kid. Um, you know, we've had interactions with him as well, on like you know YKTR Sports, and you see, um, you know, other platforms like Kempi. I've seen his interview. He did a, a podcast with Kempi. He just seems like a really like you said, nice going back to his family. Um, you know, is everything around him just seems to be flowing in the right direction when he goes out. The, I love I love these players a little bit more too. When he goes out, he plays with a lot of passion. Yeah. And and Tyson Frizzell felt felt that passion last week, right? But <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, like when he he can separate. I love those sort of players that can go out there, you know, play a hundred percent. You know, no friends on the footy field, but he just when it comes to everything outside of the game, and then you know finishing the game, he just seems like a really good guy, man. So I'm shouted for him. 
Um, but he's got a massive future. I think he's only like 21. Hopefully they can fix those rules up eventually, maybe where he can play Origin again. But uh, yeah, he's, there's plenty of good footy to come for him. He's he, 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 he's, like, he's a future star on on the wing for the for Canal Sharks. Yeah, now boy, Matty Morland sort of come back from injury, got that last 20 minutes and sort of put on a bit of a show as well. So great to see him bounce back. I know there's a lot of questions in around Moisa, but he's still their best footballer. Injuries aside, he's still the one that can probably create the most points and uh, you need points in around him. So it's going to be interesting when Nico Hines and that comes through. Um, it's going to be interesting. I always have those queries over Melbourne players once they leave the system, like how good are they really going to be? Uh, but Nico Hines is obviously a wonderful talent and he want, wants to move into the halves. So he's going to move into a system that's probably not as good with players that aren't as good. And then he'll probably have, have to wear the seven and, and wear the burden of running a team around the, the park as well. So, um, um, but hopefully Moise is in there somewhere because plenty of points in him. Yeah, they're, they're going to find themselves in a bit of a tricky situation, Cronulla, just because Ken, Will Kennedy, I thought that was one of his best games of the year. Same with old Tricky. He's good, bro. Tricky Trindle. Will Kennedy's a lock. Had, Will yeah, Kennedy's a lock. Kennedy's a lock. Fullback. They've, got a, they've obviously got the dummy half position sorted now, but Trindle's looking very good. Metcalf looks special. I don't know what his future is in terms of positions. They, mm. they've, got, they've got a lot of nice pieces, and they, if you throw Dale Finucane and, and Nico Hines into that system, they're going to be, they're going to be a good side, Cronella. So um, Cam it's, it's, not exactly, exactly, it's not exactly like Sean leaves and they pack it up and start a rebuild. I think Wade Graham came out yesterday and basically said the reason he's coming back next year, he said, I think we're, we're almost there. And you get Craig Fitzgibbon in. Who knows, man? Who knows? Yeah, Fitz, Fitzy will be unreal for Wade in particular, like, and then I, th- I think it'll come down to Scatman Moylan and, and Nico Hines starting, or they'll be the preferred options. And then it's up to those younger guys to put some pressure on. And, you know, like Trindle has been playing a fair bit, that Metcalf, if they can put some pressure on in the preseason, then who knows? No, nah, you, go, you go Hines and Moyser straight up. Yeah. How quick does Metcalf look, though, man? I love him. Yeah, yeah. Bench. I remember when he was at Manly, he was doing like good things. Like I only remember him from the from the nines, bro. They, that's nines, that's yeah. I'm seeing him. I don't remember him. I don't know if he ever played at Manly, but no, I didn't play. Oh, I might have got one or two. I'm not too sure. Anyway, uh, let's roll on then because we obviously got a lot to get through quickly. Uh, onto the Roosters. I so I just want to touch on them because I think I heard Michael Winner say it after the game, it's Trent Robinson's best year coaching. How the fuck this team are in the top four, I don't know, but they're still doing the damn thing. Obviously, another clinic yesterday, Sammy Walker comes on and does it, but have you been surprised at all by how the Roosters have sort of managed to roll through this or is this just what Roosters doing Roosters shit? No, nah, Roosters doing, it just shows the strength of the club. A lot like Melbourne, I think if they had a bunch of injuries, they'd just be dragging people up and they fall into a system and um, they just don't beat themselves. Like the great teams don't beat themselves. A lot mm. of teams, like you always go, oh, if we done that right or, or if we got that core right, that's what like losing teams talk about. Melbourne's, the Roosters, they don't have these sort of situations where they, the, the, the outcome of the game is always in their control. And if they get beat, someone's rocked up and turned up and beat them. But obviously you've got James Tedesco, who's just gone from like here to like <laughs> even higher. You know, we're, we're hot on Tommy at the, at the at the minute and rightfully so, but he just shows how, how class he is. I think a guy that slipped on in that team was Drew Hutchison. Thank you. He, Mutters. Who might have touched it to? He is he is slipped on in that team. And like Good I know regard, he, mate. <laughs> Savvy Walker gets it, like he'll come on and score a couple tries and set him up and he's got that X factor about him. But Drew Hutchison does all the kicking. Um, he gets most of the ball as well. I know he's not that quick or anything, but he's got touches of class in and around him. He's just not quick. That's what sort of hurts <laughs> yeah. him a bit. But like he kicks really well. Um, he was a, I remember him in his, as a junior, like he had all the wraps in and around him. Big wraps on him yeah. Huge wraps. So he might be like the, like, like the next version of Blake Green where his yeah, career didn't quite go well at the start, but he might roll into some really good sides where you might have a really good seven. You'd be able to pick him up for 250, 300. Yeah. And you can just hold that 5'8 position for you pretty well and, and do a job for you. So, um, yeah, I was watching him closely yesterday and he was pretty good. Obviously, the Jared situation, fuck, I thought he was gone. So, um, <laughs> shout out to Jared's flexibility. Yeah, yeah that was unreal. I don't know how we got back up after that. But, um, yeah, right, right back to the start of it all, like, I'm not surprised, but I'm just so impressed with the Roosters and what they've been able to do. And in particular, the coaching job of Trent Robinson, like we mentioned last week as well. And Teddy, like I just touched on a lot of it. I was pretty impressed by the Dragons um, fight back to yesterday. Like I had a couple go. of younger guys, a couple of, couple of young guys that they've got coming through. Normally has been speaking about them. Um, Junior Ramon and, and uh, little Bud Sullivan coming on and playing hooker for them. Like those guys... It hasn't been a good period for them in the last five or six weeks, but they're getting 
to to blood some of these guys. Like Sloan's come in and played a bit of footy for them. I know they've got like a high opinion of all those guys. Like normally will be moving on next year, as we know. But he speaks so highly of those young kids. So in particular, I was just watching how they dealt with being behind to fight themselves back in. And then obviously coming up against an elite franchise in the, in the Roosters who then, like, it's, I always look to learning curves. Whenever I'm watching games, it's not always about results. I'm always looking to see how players are reacting away from the footy, in the end goal line, you know, what their body language is like. And it just looks like those younger players in particular for the Dragons, for me, look like they're excited about being out there. Um, you know, the, the, hopefully they don't carry the scars too much this year because I think there's going to be some some good footy for the Dragons in the next couple of years. I disagree. I think I think they're, they're going to be in trouble for a bit longer. Like, I know they signed George Burgess, who's come off the back of a hip injury that no one's ever had before. Um, if they can get Moses Sully, it depends what version of Moses Sully they get. Like, <clears> if they get the nice version, fuck, that's going to be the pickup of the year. If they don't, like, who knows, man? So, yeah, like you said, Scope, hopefully they're not carrying too many scars with them. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I think they're in for a still more, bit more of a rebuild. Um, you just don't want you just don't want young players coming into and like I know a lot of people have got, been going for Normie's head, but you don't want to throw too many young players in too early when they get so used to losing. It can like mm. sort of fuck up their development. If you look at someone, the best example I can think of is DCE and Kieran Foran. They were both young halves, but they rolled into a winning system and they knew how to win. Same with Cameron Munster, same with Jerome Hughes. Like they roll into winning systems and they know how to win. So um, I know Gus Gould's always big on that type of development. I've heard him talk about Reese Walsh and Sam Walker when he's talked about like, ideally you'd only would have liked them to play five, 10 games this year, get a bit more confidence and then roll into a sort of 20 to 25 season. You can sort of see with Sammy Walker now, like he looks like a little bit drained, a little bit tired, probably why he's starting from the bench as well. Still going to have the impact on, on games, but man, that's a fucking grind. So sometimes you're just going to throw those older guys in like normally at the moment, take all the hits and, and get all the, all the bagging. Cause it's going to help these younger guys down the track. Yeah, I agree with just the point you said there. Their recruitment needs to just be a touch better. But um, with with what I was talking about, I'm just more excited about some of the young guys. If they can put them in the right positions with the right players moving forward mm. over the next couple of years. Mm. You, 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 don't want to, you don't want to start both of them next year and they end up being like 0-5 and, and then, fuck, footy starts yeah. to feel like... Oh, I know, you still got Hunty there. That's, that's what I mean. Yeah, like, I agree. Hunty, Hunty will be there. He's the seven. It's up to those guys to fight for that sixth position. And if they if they don't, then just in and around the team, maybe in a 14 role. Um, mm. Duff's moving on, so Tyrell might get a shot. Uh, Tyrell Sloan might get a shot. He's good, bro. He's spot. good. Yeah, he's nice. He's got he a little Kennedy vibe little to him, eh? Like, just nice and balanced with yeah. the way he runs, a bit rangy. Um, yeah, he's yeah, good. So. Bro, he, he reminds me a heaps of a bit of a throwback to, like, uh, David Peachy. Yeah, yeah remember David Peachy used to glide around the field, bro? That's who, that's who he reminds me of. Mm. Uh, the thing with the Dragons, bro, I just don't get what their attack is doing. So, like, obviously they don't have massive forwards and stuff like that, so none of them have great sort of leg speed, besides maybe Tarek Sims. I know Paul Vaughan's gone as well. But then they try to shift to get yards. But whenever they shift to get yards, their back rowers aren't really punching onto the ball anyway. So they're always sort of playing off the back foot. So I'd be really reassessing the way that they they play football. And if you look at them, they only try and set up big shots. So all their, all their plays need a lot of players in there. If you look at someone like a Luke, Carey, for example, he needs him in a back rower. James Maloney, he needs him in a back rower for them to throw shape. You look at um, Dragons, bro, you need to be out the back of someone and out the back of someone. And they don't really have an offload game or a second phase game in them. So they're quite predictable and you can pick them off pretty easily. And it's, you don't have go forward and then you know what shape's coming. Man, NRL teams just eat that shit up. Yeah. Oh, one good thing out of it was it was good to see old Mudders Normie having a dig and having a few runs of the footy scope. I know you would love that. And um, quick yeah, little, he's, little. he's playing aggressive. He started a little bit slow, but he really got himself into the game. Probably the back end of the first half, and yeah. And to be fair, he has like he has made a few errors over the last couple of weeks, but you can see there's a real intent in his game, and he's taking a little bit more. He's yeah, you know, he's feeling the pressure of sort of his situation at the start of games, and he you can see he looks a bit nervous. But once he gets in the game, he's he's playing a lot better, and and even if he throws fucking makes a few errors, at least. You know, I guess as a fan, you just want to see him having a crack. And I, and I think that's what he's been doing the last couple of weeks in particular. That's where their points come from. If Normie's having a crack, they score points. It's pretty it's pretty simple when you watch him play. But I just, mm. real quick one for you, Scope. Speaking of Mudders 5.8s, who shows fatigue, fatigue quicker, Drew Hutchinson or Fozzie? Fozzie's the king, Jeez. bro. Fozzie's the Fozzie's king. Fozzie's the king. Hutchinson, Fozzie's gone bro, after this. I'm just going to get that red on the footy field, though. <laughs> 
I'll tell you what, with Mattis Hutchinson, when I seen him playing six for the Roosters, I thought, that's why I wouldn't play the Belrose, because I think I could get picked up here and play for the Roosters <laughs> at six when I see Mattis Hutchinson. Shut the fucking fuck up. <laughs> well, hey, well, if I just got to work on my kicking game and kick a few fucking... Because, you know, I'm, I kick the, the kick goals at a high click as well, you which do. the Roosters need. So, um, Goldie uh, jokes though. aside, jokes <laughs> aside, Fozzie is gone up, like, like I said, the second set of the game, he's fucking. He was, I've seen him getting into Jossie, Jossie Schuster uh, in the Raiders game because he used to do this to me too. Like if he, if I got up top, he comes in and gets legs, and you don't finish off the tackle. Um, I've seen him getting into Joshy Schuster. And fuck, he's getting up a marker going, pushing him and carrying on a treat. He hates that shit, but it was a giggle to watch. Man, he'd be gas doing leg swings and warm up. I reckon, old fuzzy. <laughs> All right, boys. Hey, look, we've, oh, we've, only got, we've only got five minutes to go, boys. We did want to touch on MILF and the expansion teams, but just a quick shout out to Anthony MILF. We don't, we don't have to dive too deep on it, but obviously, been under pressure. We mentioned off the top, he came in, played an unreal game. Even though he sunk my boys, it was good to see MILF out there doing his thing. And um, yeah, I'm sure he's going to go on to bigger and better things at South. But lastly, five minutes to go, Ice. I wanted to touch on the expansion team today, sort of D Day, where the teams are all meeting with uh, Sir Peter Villandes and sort of putting their final bids together. It's going to be in Brisbane whether it's Redcliffe or the Jets or the fucking Firehawks, which is the worst name in football. Um, just overall thoughts, <laughs> overall thoughts on just real quick on, on the expansion team heading up to Brisbane. Um, good or good, good or bad for the game. An, an extra um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if we've got the playing talent or we've got the coaching talent or the development talent that we can sort of expand, but I think it's going to happen nonetheless. So we just got to roll with it. My personal opinion, I'd pick Redcliffe. Eh? Um, they're, they're a club that's already got fans. Apparently they've got assets of a hundred million dollars. So they're not, it's not going to be an NRL team where you rock up like sort of Titans and OA and you're training on willy nilly fields here and there. Um, they've got the setup there and they've, they've got the fan base and I'd, I'd be going there. Like you said, Firehawks is the lamest name out there. Jets, I don't know. Uh, my personal opinion, I'd be going there and try and recruit Queensland-style players up there as well that actually care about the area. Scott? I'll oh, keep it short and, uh, short, and, short and sharp. I think it's an awful awful decision. I just don't think the talent is there across the board in, in both playing playing roster and, and coaching and development rosters as well to, to bring in a new team. I think they need to really build up the strength of the comp at the lower teams before they even think about this. Like, a couple Agreed. of the clubs in particular just just aren't strong enough at the moment. So this is going to weaken them, weaken them even more. And, you know, just to make a bit of fat, like, you know, we all love a bit of Bunsen. Don't get me wrong. But at the expense of uh, just drowning out the bottom of the comp even more, I think the, the bigger, the top four or five teams will stay even stronger during this period. And, and the, the bottom teams will, will sort of drop out even more. But if you get the right guys in the right place, scope it might be like I know another team's going to go down anyway. But if you look at like a Melbourne 1998, bro, they 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 won a comp by 99, and they set up like if they've got the right mm. people in the right place with the right systems, and they get the right catchment areas, bro, that it could be a really good club. But then obviously there's just going to be another club sure. that falls down the bottom as well. So, man, you're hoping for a Melbourne sort of situation, um, but who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, you got Melbourne, you got the Titans, like. There's two yeah, different Gary's ways right. of looking at it. Right. <laughs> All right, boys. I think we'll wrap it up there. Obviously, Wednesday's show, like I said, we're going to be back in studio, so that'll be good. But I've enjoyed these Zoom ones, boys. It's good. Drew, yeah. Drew Hutchinson, the new Blake Green. I'm telling you. Yeah. Call him in now. All right, boys. Later. Mutters Hutchinson. Right. <laughs>